Hi, and welcome to the Intentional Wealth Update from Morton Brown Family Wealth for the week of February 14th, 2022, Valentine's Day week. Good morning, guys. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? Good. All right. So it's the week of Valentine's Day. Moving on. Uh, we're going to talk today about <laughs> re- retiring early. So we found, we found a great article in the Wall Street Journal highlighting a, a number of case studies of people who stepped away, retired early, different circumstances, some in their control, some out of their control. And this was a lot of fodder for conversation internally. Katie, lay out what, what some of these decisions people made, why they were walking away, and how they ended up with the decision to retire early. Yeah, you, you know, they, they highlighted three or four different um, couples or individuals and, and their decisions to retire early. And the common theme that the article highlighted was they reached their number. They hit their retirement number and they felt as if they were ready to step away, even though their plan may have been to work for another three, five years or so. So that that was the most common thing that, that I heard. It was interesting, though, because a number of them, you know, do have active like financial plans, working with advisors, you know, kind of mapping it out. But it did bring up some interesting conversations with us, the types of things that we look for or things that you want to make sure to consider the impact of if you are making an early retirement decision. So. Yeah, I always remember those uh, commercials from years ago where people would carry around their big orange numbers as if there was a, a number they had. Once they hit that number, I can retire. But Katie, you brought up a good point that, you know what, if you just, if you hit that number four years earlier, then that's not actually the number. You have to, there's a gap to fill to cover income and expenses and, and everything else that, that that's from 56 to 60 or 60 to 64, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have, you know, $2 million as your number at age 65, and now you're deciding to step away at age 60, what happens in that five years? And Cody, I know you often talk about this too. I mean, there may be expenses that are popping in there that that you might not be considering the full extent of. That number at 65 may not be the same number when you actually get there. Yeah, you may have a number, say, for an example, the one um, scenario in, in the article was they wanted to get $2 million in their 401k before they retired. So they hit that number er- earlier than expected with the S&P growing so well for the past three years. But then if they're retiring, say at 60 instead of 65, there's a lot more expenses that they may not have planned in, whether it be just traveling more because they're they're healthier than they could have potentially been at 65 or just Medicare expenses, um, that five-year gap there that they have to cover for health insurance. Just want to make sure that you're not underestimate some of the expenses if you choose to, to retire early. And some of those expenses, Cody, might be discretionary too, because we talk about those high quality retirement years. So say retiring at 60, your original plan was to retire at 65 and you're going to have 10 really high quality years to age 75 where you're going to spend on travel and everything else before things start to slow down a little bit. Well, suddenly you're retiring at 58 or 60. Does that mean you have 15 years of, of higher expenses and everything else? Is it is it adding more to the higher quality years, which, which changes the math around everything? Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of changing math, the impact on Social Security, I think, can be... Mm-hmm overlooked very easily. I think there's a couple of factors there. One, if you were timing your retirement around the time that you might begin receiving Social Security income, and now you're not going to receive that income for several years down the road, once again, that's more pressure than on your other investments to fill that gap. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing that's really important is when the Social Security Administration sends out those, you know, estimated benefits, they are assuming that you will continue at your current earnings rate up until that full retirement age. And so if if they are basing their calculations on you, say you're making $150,000 or $200,000, they're assuming you're going to continue that from age 60 to 67, and they're adjusting all their calculations to account for that. Well, now if you're not, rather than having $200,000 in the calculations, you might have some of those like early earning years or maybe only made $20,000 and that's going to bring down your average and bring down the actual Mm -hmm. income amount that you receive. So that's really important to go to the website and run the actual calculations with reduced or no income kind of plugged into those final years to get a better idea of your true estimate. Yeah. And and Cody, we were also talking about the, this idea that, okay, so you're maxing out your 401k. That's another thing that that's not happening. You know, if you're putting twenty five thousand dollars a year in, compound that twenty five thousand dollars by five percent tax free over thirty years. I mean, that's that's for every year you miss, it's a hundred thousand dollars plus 
that's not kind of lobbed onto the back end of retirement there. Yep. And then obviously the the match from from the company, obviously the company mm-hmm. hopefully helping out on going back to the Medicare on some of the premiums for, for insurance. So that there's a bunch of added expenses, but just want to make sure that they're obviously talking through the expenses, making sure that you're not taking too much out in the beginning years, because obviously going into retirement, you, you're compounding, hopefully the interest growing the accounts, but then it can compound on the way down if you're taking too much out and you're not able to get the growth of, of the 401k or IRA. This comes back to the inflation conversation too, because you think about like, what are the, you know, a big concern from retirees we hear is what do I do to compete against inflation? Well, tax-free compounding is one of them. Getting employer matches is another. Getting even employees have a lot more wage leverage than they've had in years. You know, you're not going to get those cost of living increases, you know, necessarily. You might have more leverage to do that as an employee than you do as a social security uh, recipient. You know, those kinds of things play in. But then there's also your investment allocation. They, they go through the investment allocation of one particular retiree. Cody, do you want to talk about the the, the uh, 2022 portfolio that, that one particular retiree had? <laughs> yeah, the, the one retiree, their investment allocation was interesting to say at least. It was around 30 to 40 percent in cryptocurrency. I think it was Bitcoin particularly. And then a decent amount in cash too. I think another 30, 40 percent in cash. And then the rest was in some alternative like oil and, and fuel investments. Yeah. Might have been yeah. a little bit of traditional stock in there, but it was ten <laughs> percent or so. Yeah, I yeah. forgot about the the normal allocation. Yeah, Katie, what's your gut instinct to tell you when you see a portfolio, especially for an early retiree, that looks like that? Um, my my gut instinct right now is that there's a lot more risk baked in there than they may realize. So obviously, there's you know. Kind of the expected risk. We, we talk about risk when, when you get into things like commodities and cryptocurrencies and, and how those can be extremely volatile. I mean, we can see, you know, especially in the crypto side, 30, 40, 50% swings in any given day. Not that that happens every day, but there's significant swings on the one end of the spectrum. But then the other end of the spectrum, any amount of inflation, as we're experiencing right now, is eroding the buying power of that cash. So that piece of the portfolio is by definition losing right. money. You're losing that purchasing power. So I, I think that there's there are some things that that particular portfolio uh, or that particular individual could do to, to, to narrow that volatility band and, and have a little bit more predictability going forward. Yeah. As I mean, predictable as this place can be. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. And this whole article felt very reactive. It felt as though a stim- stimulus, not not government stimulus, but some stimulative event happened. The employee responded. And even the, the portfolio seemed a little bit reactive. It's a lot. There, there wasn't much staying the course. It was very like, you know, react, reactive feeling and everything else. Well, they did highlight some other individuals inside that article too that have you know, active financial advisory relationships and active plans. And they did think through the process. I mean, I, I do think that it is achievable uh, for people to retire early with the right considerations put into place and, and making sure that they have a, a, a more holistic view. And, and I think in in those cases, there there was a thoughtful process of, of how to structure the portfolio and how to think about you know short term goals, long term goals. I, I definitely think that that's that can be done. But but Dennis, outside of the financials, what are some other considerations? I know yeah. we talk about this often, and you're really good at pulling some of this stuff forward. Yeah, it just so happened right around the time this came out, uh, I was listening to a podcast, the Finding Mastery podcast with um, Dr. Michael Gervais, who's a sports performance psychologist, but he was interviewing a neuroscientist. And the, the, the topic that really grabbed my attention was this idea that pre-early retirees also tend to die earlier. And that just grabbed my attention immediately. And what he talks about is the reason why, and it's because if we don't work muscles, you know, muscles on our bodies, they, they tend to atrophy. They don't function as well. They don't support. That's why a lot of times, you know, the skeletal system comes under a lot of strain because we don't maintain our muscle strain. There's a lot of advocacy for lifting weights now just to make sure we can support our frames. But the same thing goes for your brain is that if you're not going through what he refers to as just a beneficial stress, this kind of stress that we have when we're working through problems constructively, even when an infant does when they're learning a language, like they start from zero and they have to socialize and learn and, and really build upon building. 
if those skills don't continue to grow, they atrophy. And if we start that atrophy process earlier or don't consciously keep it up, then that can be a problem for us cognitively. I mean, retirement is only a construct of the last couple of generations. And going back into history, people didn't retire. They didn't live past 50. But now we're talking about lifespans that could be into the 90s. And if you're retiring at 58, are you thinking about how to maintain the, the muscle strength, the brain strength, and all of those things? I think it's worth considering because we just don't have the data to understand just the long-term impact of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I think that, and I think that whether it was recognized in those terms or not is a challenge for a lot of retirees just making that transition into how do I do things differently? How do I fill, how do I fulfill myself educationally, intellectually, and in other ways to kind of keep those muscles working for you? So that, that the science behind it is really fascinating. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we, we gave our Super Bowl picks a couple of weeks ago. Super Bowl is now in the bag. The Rams won contrary to our, our picks, but we also had the social phenomenon, the, the, uh, the pop, you know, phenomenon of, I, I think this, this felt like a, a, a Gen X Super Bowl. Katie, between the, the E-Trade baby was back. Dr. Evil was back. The Sopranos, the halftime show. Did you guys have a favorite throwback moment from the commercial setting of, of the Super Bowl? I, I just love the halftime show. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I know. That, that was Katie's jam. <laughs> it was like, it was like reliving college there for, for a few minutes. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah, it really it really felt like like the 2000 2001 Super Bowl with with E Trade Baby with uh, the Sopranos. I, I just remember watching the Sopranos on was it Sunday nights and everything else. I associate yeah. football with the Sopranos, um, so that that was a, that was a good thing to say. Cody, how about you? What did you like best? Well, I like the the actual football game the best, but oh. I did like that. I did like <laughs> I did like the Super Bowl uh, halftime show. I I thought it was good too. I'm bummed the Bengals didn't win, but. I thought it was a good Super Bowl. Good, good. All right. Well, good conversation today. You know, retiring early is one of the more complex topics that we can talk about. I mean, is it changing in expectations? So if you have questions or things that we didn't follow up on today, please feel free to reach out to us. Otherwise, we will catch up with you again in a couple of weeks.